internet internet work. Best guesses. Clients and servers. Clients and servers. Satellites. Satellites is also one of those. The best answer, actually, I wasn't expecting it that fast and that and that good. Clients and servers is the answer to that question. Both physical and virtual. Clients and servers. What's a client? A computer or a mobile device or something that connects uh, asking requesting information from a server. From a server. And what's a server? Yes. Uh, develop that out a little bit further. What is a server? Processing unit that gives you uh, the information that you're asking for or that holds it. Okay. Yes, it is a processing unit that gives you information that you're asking for or holds it. But conceptually speaking, is it anything bigger than that? It's just two entities that talk to each other. Clients are a many to one, servers are a one to many. Okay? You can think of servers as the hub in a wheel and clients as the spokes leading outward. They connect inward to a server, okay? And, and that is a really simplistic view of it, but it's also sometimes the best way to think about things. It's the simplest way to think about things. Clients and servers make up the internet. Servers are something that what? Serves, gives you something, right? What do you think of as a client? Why do we call them clients? In a lot of ways, they're a customer. That's a really good answer. They want something. They're expecting to be given something. They pay something for that, and then they are served, right? We're going to continue the analogy that I gave you yesterday of the big house, all right? How does the cloud work? I'm going to talk more about how the cloud works today by extending that analogy of the house that has about 65,000 doors in it. We talked about email yesterday and how when a secure email is sent from a server to another server, from a client to another server through the um, sundry mail transfer agents that exist out there, when it goes to live on the server that it's going to live on, it knocks on door number 993 of that house. The internet is often conflated with the World Wide Web. And we're going to talk more about what the difference between the Internet and the World Wide Web is tomorrow when we talk about DNS or domain name service. But today what we're going to talk about really is the Internet. The Internet is the physical existence of those clients and servers, not necessarily the virtual implementation of them. The Internet is, is physical. It's these bits and pieces we have here. It's Cat5 cable. It's boxes. It's computers, it is the, the fiber optic cable laid on the ocean floor, okay? The <coughs> it is also accurate to say that the internet is Wi-Fi signal, is any of the hotspots that you yourself create. You can create internet and take it away. Internet is fungible. Um, when you turn your phone on and you create a hotspot with your phone so that you can log into it from your laptop, you are making a bit of internet right then, okay? You're creating a place where a client can get on board and go look at servers and get what they what they want out of it, right? So when we think about going and getting information on the internet, it's often as simple as thinking to ourselves, I'm going to type in google.com and that will take me to Google. But what does it mean to be taken to Google, to go there, physically go there? Redirected, redirected is a good answer or, or more just directed. Theoretically, if you're being redirected to Google, you should be notified of that fact. Well, Google redirects you to other sites. Google provides links to other sites, but it doesn't physically redirect you to other sites. And we'll talk more about the nature of being redirected when it comes to DNS tomorrow, but it's a really good guess. When we talk about, about going to a website, what we're talking about is our browser as a client, right? It's something that is looking to, to get service from somewhere traveling to via, assume magic for right now, but again, DNS happens tomorrow, and we'll talk more about that. It's complex enough to, to warrant its own discussion. So assume a little bit of magic. Your client here goes and knocks on the door of Google, which is a big house that has 65,000 doors. And your browser goes looking at door number 80. All right, we talked about servers also, and sometimes I conflate the computer that servers live on and the server itself, and I'm, I don't want to do that. This is the day that I'm going to separate those two things apart for you. 
There is a physical computer, like this laptop right here, which is, in fact, right now, and also can be a server. There is a physical computer out there that theterra.com lives on. It's not this MacBook right here. It lives in Dallas somewhere in a rack of servers served by Rackspace, which is a cloud computing company. And in that big mess of computers, just think about a big wall that blinks and you've got a basic idea of what these computers look like. They don't look like your everyday desktop computers, but they're basically made of the same things. They've got a hard drive, they've got memory, and they've got processors. They store stuff and they serve stuff as required. On those computers, I have a, an instance, and we can talk more about the nature of hypervisors and spinning up cloud servers in the future, especially as, as many of you may want to have more of a specialty in this over time. Um, but on those computers, I have the virtual implementation of this computer right here. There is a big old storage setup in Dallas, Fort Worth that has multiple different virtual computers on it. One of those virtual computers belongs to me. That virtual computer is one that has multiple services running on it. Sometimes we conflate services and servers. For the purposes of this discussion, it's pretty accurate to conflate them. And on that computer lives theterra.com, redqueentech.com, a couple of other websites that live out there. And if you think of that virtual computer, which is a um, it's not actually, although I held up this machine right here as a MacBook, it's actually not a computer that is made out of OS X or the Mac operating system. It's actually made out of something called Ubuntu. How many of you have heard of Linux before? Awesome. How many of you know the difference between Linux and Debian? I don't know quite the difference, but the difference is still there. Actually, Linux is the base from which many of these distros are created. It's a very good guess. Yes, Debian is one of the distros that is created from the base Linux kernel, right? Like a yes. Short word for distribution kind of, right? Yes, and distro is a short word for distribution. It's also accurate to call it an operating system. Okay? So Debian, or in the case of the spe specific one that I have, Ubuntu, is an open source operating system that is, it is not just the operating system running on this computer, it functionally, for the purposes of the cloud, is the computer. Okay? How many of you want to ask questions about what I'm talking about right now? Go ahead and ask questions anytime you want to. You can't stop me. It's okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean when I say just go ahead? What's that? <coughs> Debian. Debian. Yes, Google Debian. Yeah. You're going to find out that there are some kinds of operating systems of, of Linux distros that are more commonly used than others to create these kinds of virtual computers. A very common one to use is Ubuntu. There are other really common ones out there too, FreeBSD, a few other things like that. Um, many of them are Linux based, some of them are not. Some of them, like Mac OS X, is Linux based, but it's functionally not Linux really anymore, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but for the purposes of this discussion, they're all just different things, and we can, we can call them Windows and Mac and Linux. You can serve a website on lots of different kinds of computers. You can serve a website up on something that Windows calls Internet Information Services, or IIS. That is the, the little guy running around inside the house if the house is made of Windows, and it is a good idea to just think of this house as made of Ubuntu, or made of Mac, or made of Windows. In a Windows house, a website is going to be served up by a service called Internet Information Services. On a Linux machine, like the one that I have the Terra running on, it is served up by a little guy called Apache. All right? And on Mac, I have no idea because I don't think I, well, they've got some kind of Mac server set up. I don't think I've actually ever set up a website to run on a Mac server before, which I should probably do that just to see what happens. So on, in this house, made of Ubuntu, made of Linux, there are lots of, of critters running around inside that house doing stuff. One of the things that you can do in a server like that, in a computer like that, is you can store files. You can just send stuff there and let it sit so that you can go get it later on. Think of it like a room in the house that's full of file cabinets. All right. If I wanted to, I could take, for instance, my entire digital photography collection and I could go and spin up a house made out of Ubuntu 
and just go store all my photos on it if I wanted to. And it would no longer be in my house, it would be on a virtual computer in Dallas or Chicago or Denver or Atlanta or wherever the, the physical servers were located that my, that my virtual machine was located on. All right. Am I, am I doing pretty well on explaining what this, what's happening so far? Are you following me here? I want to see some nodding heads. Okay, good. So the next thing that we think about is that inside this house, and I'm going to use uh, Ubuntu Linux as an example here, and the reason why is it's probably by far the most common one that you'll run into that people will be using. You, many of the people in this class may actually get to work on a Windows in, uh, Internet Information Services website in future, and that tends to be because local companies will often use Microsoft services here in Seattle, and you'll, be, you'll get some sponsorship and stuff like that for it. If you want to let them in, you can. Okay. So, inside this house is file cabinets where you can store information. Inside this house is also a service that lets you get in and get out of the house, the butler. All right? The butler is going to open doors for you. All right? Now, when you go to a house like the one that I have set up, and you want to access theterra.com, does anyone know what door I'm going to go knock on? to access that website. Best guess, do you know what port in the house, what door? What's that? 80, excellent. Door number 80 is typically the door used for HTTPS, or H, uh, sorry, HTTP services. What does HTTP stand for? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, excellent. That is the door that you go knock on to get a website, a non-secure website served up in. What about HTTPS? What does the S stand for? Secure. Secure, excellent. Best guess is on the port, the door that you go knock on. Door number 443. You go knock specifically on those doors because behind that door is someone saying yes or no, there is or is not a website behind here that you're looking for. All right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. The house and doors is just a metaphor for the computer. That's exactly what it is. The house has about 65,000 doors. You could get into any one of them. You can specify, in a, there's, there's default doors and you can specify different ones if you want to, but usually you'll knock on door number 80 to get a website. You'll knock on door number 443 to get a secure website. You will knock on door number 22 to get an SSH connection. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Go ahead. So then, like, let's say I'm trying to connect to a server, like a game server, and I'm getting a mm -hmm. code, and it's like 404 or okay. even code 80. Is, are those basically saying, like, you were having problems ah. with this door? That is an excellent question. When you get an error when you are on a website and it says something like um, error 500 or error 530 database connections or you get an error 404 resource not found, those are HTTP errors. Those are not errors on the server. What that, what's happening right there when you see a 404 is not about the door you're knocking on. Instead, the guy behind the door is like, whoa, there's nothing here. The thing you're looking for doesn't exist. And so in HTTP, um, that is the, that's the error that you're going to receive in your browser window. And those codes, 404, 202, you, you, don't, you won't normally see the 200 um, error codes because they're not error codes. They're server response codes, actually. And 200 means, yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Here's all the stuff. The 300 response codes tend to be, you're being mysteriously redirected, and I hope you're okay with that. Could be a temporary, could be a permanent redirect, and that's where your question about redirects comes in. Okay, um, 400s, something's wrong. Eek, oh my god. Usually you're going to see the 404, which means that you went to look for theterra.com at the server that it was supposed to be at, and there was nothing there. We're going to talk more about how you find those servers tomorrow with DNS and World Wide Web tomorrow, but assume for right now that you got there. If you got there and the server exists, but the website isn't there, you will get a 404. You'll get a 404 for a lot of different things, okay? If the website exists there, but, the, uh, but there's something wrong with the database serving that site, 
for instance, you're going to a WordPress site. How many of you have ever, have ever seen a WordPress site that should be there, but you saw the error message, error establishing a database connection? Any of you seen that? Yeah. That is going to be in the 500 server response codes range. Okay, and what that means is there's a specific kind of error, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about it. All right, you can you can learn more about these response codes when you do something like turning on debugging in an installation. You you will have seen these when you've done your PHP work, or if any of you have done any PHP work, you certainly will here. You'll learn how to debug in PHP and to get those server response codes and interpret them. Okay. Is that pretty clear? Do you understand the difference between a server response code and the, the doors you're going to go knock on on the computer? Yes? No? Does anyone not understand what I'm talking about? And remember, if you don't understand what I'm talking about and you don't raise your hand right now, then I'm going to get a little frustrated because I, I want to know that you're getting this, at a, that at least most of the folks in the room are getting this. And if you're nodding your head, I'm going to keep going. If I get blank faces, I check in with you to find out if, if you're understanding what's happening. I'm here to serve you. This is definitely a server-client relationship happening right here, okay? You are coming to me and I am throwing knowledge out at you and when I see people go, that is a bounce back. All right, yes. The, what we're talking about right now is the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. The internet is the physical manifestation of the connection between boxes and the, the existence of this stuff in real time. You can make internet, you can take away internet, you can, the internet can fail in places. That we're going to talk more about what the, uh, World Wide Web and DNS is tomorrow and how that system works. That is a very good question. There's a reason, thank you, yes, they do conflate them together often. And it's very easy to conflate them. But the World Wide Web is not the same thing as the Internet. For the purposes of this discussion, you can imagine the World Wide Web is the postal system that gets mailed to the house, and the house is the Internet. The roads that go back and forth between the houses as the Internet. Okay, and the postal system is what's getting those mail, that, that mail back and forth, or messages back and forth. Does that make sense as a metaphor? Okay, good. Oh, sorry. Yes. How the houses and the roads are like the internet, okay? Houses and roads are like the internet, and the postal system that gets messages around back and forth between the houses is like the World Wide Web. And what we're going to do tomorrow is talk more about how that postal system works. Right now, what we're focusing on is how does the internet work? How do all of these connections get made? We're going to talk a little bit more in future about what Wi-Fi means, but let's just assume right now that roads are made up of either hard connections or soft connections between computers. Right now, if I wanted to, I could turn the hotspot on this, on this phone on and give you all the Wi-Fi password to the hotspot on my phone. I would be crazy to do that, and it would be fun to try, and sooner or later we should probably give that a shot, maybe when I'm not on a limited data plan. Um, but that, it, that would be creating internet. Do you understand why I mean that, what I'm talking about? Okay, good, excellent. How does the phone connect to the internet? That is an excellent question. The phone connects to the internet based on the mobile towers that are in the area. This has a data connection and it has a, um, what are they called? It's, a, is it a, it's not a SIP connection. There are multiple different kinds of connections. and. The funny part here is I actually used to work for um, a, a company that did mobile telephony called Silent Circle, um, but the problem is I was working on the websites, and as much as I tried to dig into exactly how cell phones work, I, I, it's, it's radio waves the same as Wi-Fi would work, it's all on different frequencies. Um, I've never actually taken apart a cell phone physically and put one back together again to try to figure out how they work. I've done it virtually in like you know hacked phones themselves, but not taken them apart to figure out to figure They're out the hardware. The same as um, mm -hmm. seen before, like uh, sort of USB thing that you plug into your computer to get internet from. That that's just bypassing the Wi-Fi on your phone. Are you talking about using like I'm USB about, tethering? I'm talking about on a computer is um, uh -huh. a thing you can buy. It's basically portable internet. It's yes, tethering. same thing. Yeah, that is the exact same thing that you would find on this phone. The unit inside that mobile tethering device is the same thing that you find inside a phone. Yeah. And those are becoming less and less popular as more and more uh, wireless carriers realize that they are absolute freaking morons for not just building it into their phones and letting people use it. 
okay? All right, so inside this house are a lot of people running around. Have you ever heard of an FTP server? What does FTP stand for? File transfer protocol, excellent. And what door does the file transfer protocol client knock on by default to try to find out if someone's there to serve files? 20 to 21. Excellent, 20 to 21, usually 21, right? Okay, and then if it's knocking on door 21, what is, what is an FTP client expect to find at door number 21? The file server that can go and get the files that are stored in the house, yes. So you, you might think of it this way. You're not actually, when you're using these services, getting into the house, all right? You're knocking on the door and standing there and waiting patiently until someone hands something out to you and says, okay, here, here's the thing you're looking for. Unless you're gonna go and take a look for something called a SSH server. And that is to get you into the house so you can run around and do whatever you want to inside the house. What does SSH stand for? Secure shell. Secure shell, excellent. What do you think Secure Shell does? Provides like an area for you to run around in? It's a good guess. It doesn't so much provide you an area to run around in as it is the keys to the house so you can go in yourself and get what you want. When you are finding out whether or not a website is there and you're getting served the images and content, these are all files that live on that server someplace. Like if you go to the front page of my website and look at the pictures that are there, those are all pictures that are stored in a metaphoric file cabinet inside the house that is that server, okay? And the little guy at door number 80 knows to go and grab those specific files and folders and make them show up on your browser for you, all right? Now, if I want into the house and I want to muck around and do stuff and maybe change around how the servers work and add a couple of services, then I need to get into the computer. And we say we, we are going to SSH into the computer, okay? You need keys to SSH into the computer. And while typically you would go and knock on door number 22 by default, it is a terrible idea not to change the door by default that you'll go and knock on. And this is because this is like locking the door and hiding the key. You should only be able to get into a house if you know where the key is or you're allowed to have keys to it, right? You know, in some cases you might be someone who's allowed to get in sometimes and you've got only a key to the back door, or only a key to the gate. Still a good metaphor for what's happening for how much of the area you can get into, all right? So say that I have, and you can tell the server, you can tell the little guy who normally would be listening at door number 22, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go hang out at door number 25,473 and only people who know to go knock on door number 25,473 will even have a chance to try the keys to get into the house okay the keys certainly won't work on any other door and you can sure try every single one of those doors that's often what happens you won't be able to get in that is absolutely how you will hack in and get into something that's something called port scanning and you know what you're doing? Anyone home? Anyone home? After door, after door, after door, after door. And if you're smart, what happens is once you've tried that a few times on a computer, then all of a sudden another little guy hanging out in the back goes, okay, somebody's been trying to pound on every single one of these doors. Someone should get a notification email, send it to the admin. That's because you've got a security guard or two running around back there listening for somebody who's knocking on every single one of the doors, making notes, all right? Yes? When I was in high school, we used a proxy server so that we could go on websites and mm -hmm. folks who would, I didn't know what they actually were though. Okay. That is an excellent question. A proxy server, for instance, that's actually something that I have set up on one of my servers myself for when I can't get into some stuff that I want to get into when I feel like it. Um, I love proxy servers. A proxy server does this. If you are on a browser like I am right here, and I don't actually know, but let's assume that the Seattle Central Internet doesn't let me access Facebook. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, how am I going to find out my cat pictures, right? You know, and exactly what everybody that I know thinks about the latest piece of news. So when this browser goes looking for 
a server, one of the first things is it does is it has to get out of its house first, right? It has to, and this is a small house that's running around in two, it has to say, can I get out of this house and do I have permission to go and try? You're asking a mommy figure, and if you've ever seen um, nanny internet software, this is what it's doing too. And your browser and any of the, the doors or bars between you and getting out into the internet to go look for what you're looking for um, will often say either first you can't make that request or once you've made the request, we're not going to let you actually pull the data back to your browser. And there's, there's a couple of different ways of doing that. A proxy server bypasses any of the safeguards that are set to keep you from staying in your house or having the pizza delivered unto you. <laughs> and pizza is a pretty good analogy for this right here too. You're either being prevented from calling for pizza in the first place or when the pizza guy shows up, there's somebody there who's like, no, you can't deliver to here. So one or the other is happening. Imagine instead that you had a tin can and a string going over to a friend's house that says, I need you to order a pizza for me and then just pass it to me through the window. That is the, the metaphoric concept of a proxy server. You are bypassing the safeguards on your house and bypassing the prevention mechanism that stops that information from coming back to you. And you're just saying, I would like to just bypass this process altogether. Does that make sense on a metaphoric